The Ghost of Marlowe House by Bobby Holmes. Available on Amazon Marketplace. Five star recommended. The following sample is Chapter One. If Lord Malow opened the window, he would be able to hear the breakers crashing over the Pacific northwest coast and breathe in the damp, salty air. He missed the smoothing sound of the sea, but he just didn't seem to get the windows open these days. Perhaps they would have rusted shut. Salt air did that sometimes, he told himself. Two women stood at the front of his front gate. Walt would see them from the, the attic, could see them from the attic window. The taller of the two, a young brunette, seemed over-excited. The excited. He pointed to his house while talking to the companion. He wondered if they intended to stand there all day, or enter the gate and make their way up to his front door. People rarely visited these days. He used a spotting scope to get a closer look at the pair. A strange new figure at a static window. The scope gave him a closer view. The ocean beyond the row of houses, separating his home from the nearby beach. Had a lone house not been two stories, plus the attic, his neighbours' rooftops would obscure the view. The house directly across the street belonged to his old friend, George Hemming. At one time it was the only house on, the side, on that side of the street. Well, what couldn't we call when the houses to the left and right of Hemming had been built or who lived there? George used to have come over regularly to share a brandy with him, but it had been ages since his last visit. Spotting scope brought the two women closer. The brunette's hair suddenly refused to stay in place, tossed carelessly by the afternoon's crusty breeze. She clearly brushed forward strands from her face. Her hairstyle was not fashionable, at least not by his day's standards. The woman, women he knew, these inspired, those inspired by the avant-garde flapper, cropped their curls short. However, he found her way, long wavy hair peeling with feminine, only more gentle area. If, here where, if he were to turn back the clock, he would assume she was married. His parents' day, day, a woman, married woman, typically wore her hair long, up, not free flowing. He guessed she was in her early twenties. She wore a fitted blink blouse over which she assumed was a skirt. And even to see what she wore from the waist down, he could only make an assumption. What could he see? He found appealing. And he also wished she would make it past his front gate. What would experience a brief surge of guilt? of such a fault. After all, what would Angelus think? Memories of Angela were fleeting and sporadic. At times he forgot her entirely. He could see a portrait hanging next to his in the library. He could, would think Angela should have returned from Portland by now, sometime. How he had lost track of the time. He turned his attention to the second woman at the gate. He didn't find her half as interesting as her companion. She is attracted enough, but she's never... Never partial to red cheeks, abundance of rusty curls fell in a mud back, recurled in a place of what he guessed was a ribbon. It's quite obvious she was a. Her companion doesn't follow the current fashion trends, he thought. His second girl was a few inches shorter than her friend, wore an unflattering boyish jacket over her outfit. Again, he assumed he had with his fr- uh, her friend as she was wearing a dress or skirt. When was the last time I had a visitor, he asked himself. There had been a women, woman with a clipboard, a man lame woman who wore tra- men's trousers. She was a much a conflictationist. The few words she spoke made little sense to him. Of course, there's not also Joanne. She came a week to clean the house. At Malow had adapted his solitude through... There were times he missed sharing a brandy with one of his friends, admiring a pretty young woman. From what he could see, the brunette was attractive. Yet by the way, her lips kept moving. She was obviously a talker. Not a treat he admired in a woman. Bored of watching the pair, Walt turned from the window, left the room, making his way down the stairs to the parlour. Outside, the two women continued to stand at his gate.
Daniel Boatman pointed to the dormer door window protruding from the masquerade rooftop. The third floor is actually the attic, she frowned, when someone in what think in one of the attic windows caught her eye. It looks like there's a standing room up there. It's a living space, perhaps, Lily suggested. She stood on her tiptoes, clutching a lion gate. Peering over the fence, she added, you might be able to put a, a couple of bedrooms up there. A bedroom bed room would be nice, but that might cost a fortune. Daniel pointed to one of the top windows. Lily, look at the attic window. Yes, Lily glanced upward. Do you see anything? There, there it is again. Knowing her green eyes, Lily studied the window. What? I didn't see anything. I don't know. Like a di- shadow passed over it. It's your imagination. I didn't see anything. Lily got, let go, Lily, let go to the gate and settled back down to the balls of her feet. I guess you're right, Daniel shrugged as they glanced over the yard. I wonder if it's one of some of those trees need to be removed. She slightly counted them. There are at least 20 on the property. Trees can play havoc with your plumbing. This place is definitely overgrown. It's like a jungle. I suppose I should be grateful the plants aren't all dead. When are you only going to be here with that key? Lily glanced down the street. Daniel pulled a telephone from her back pocket. Looked at the time. They shouldn't have been here by now. Can't wait to see inside. Are you sure you want to stay at a motel tonight? We could bring our stuff over and just stay here. We already paid for the room anyway. I want to see the condition of property at first hand. Daniel said. I bet you can see the ocean from the attic window. I think I'm jealous you get get to live here. Then he said with a laugh. I wish they'd bring that key. A moment later... Lily got a wish when a black BMW pulled up and parked in front of my low house. Daniel Boatman, the driver called out. She stepped out from a car carrying a Melina envelope. The woman slammed the car door shut and walked directly to Anna, Diana, Daniela, who offered her hand in greeting. Nice to funny meet you in person, the woman said. She took Joanna's hand. I am Gloria Cummings, Mr. Winton's assistant. I assume you're Daniela Boatman. Yes, nice to meet you at last, Mrs. Cummings. This is my friend, Lily Miller. Nice to meet you, Miss Miller. Gloria quickly shook her hand, Lily's hand and turned attention to Diana. Mr. Winton is very sorry we weren't able to meet you today. Mrs. Boatman, Fortunately, he's attained in New York and look, looks like he won't be there for a few more days. That's fine, as long as I can get the keys. I'm assured all of this, this is family settled. Of course. Gloria handed the Marilia envelope to the Dalaria. I find the keys inside, along with his necessary papers. Mr. Renton instructed me to tr- tr- include a checklist. If you have any questions, please feel free to call me. For any chance someone is inside the house right now? Diana asked. Inside the house? Not unless there's been a break in. Why? Have you seen something suspicious? Gloria asked, glancing at the house. She thought she saw something in the attic, but didn't see any I didn't see anything, Lily Addict said. A gate appears to be locked, Gloria noted. She expected a sturdy padlock. This clean lady is, was here. In this morning, went through the entire house. Unless you find a broken window or unlocked doors, I seriously doubt that you have a problem. I can't call any break in on this property since I worked for Mr. Renton. But of course, you want me to come in with you? Oh, no, that's fine, Daniel. I opened the envelope and tucked in a hand inside, searching for the keys. I'm afraid I'm running a bit late. A little late. I'd like, I should like, I should get going. Another appointment. Things are a little upside down in the office. We went to rent an out of town. Of course. I appreciate you bringing this to me, Diana. Smile, but out now holding the key ring in her hand. Well, you'll be staying, will you be staying at the house tonight? Gloria asked. We rented a room at Seahawks Hotel. I know your office said that you decided the house was in really good shape, considering everything. But I think I'd like to have a look, see what happened, needs to be done before I move in. You obviously aren't well deterred by the old superstition, Gloria said. I'm not particularly superstitious, Diana said. What superstition, Lily wondered. She was about to know the voice of question when a cell phone rang. Moving away from Diana and George, Gloria, she answered the phone while the other two women talked. Gloria looked at the vacant house. I suppose I should get 
going. She glanced at the watch. If you need anything, you know how to contact me. Gloria had already said goodbye to Diana. I was just getting in the car with Lily. And it ended a phone call. Yes, that was my mum. Lily and Diana waved to your glory and B at the B and W drove off. You want to make sure we arrived to go, okay. I guess I should have called her when we got into town. Bad daughter. Diana teased. You ready to see my house? You bet. They turned and walked to the front gate. Diana stared at the house, hesitating a moment. As so she could take another look before going inside. It really is a magnificent property, she thought. It was all hers. Following with the keys, she searched for were one to unlock the great gate. I suppose it could be considered Victorian. Lily studied his house. I don't think much about the architecture. But after they sent me a photograph, I looked online to see what I could find. They called it a Second Empire Masquerade House, or something like that. Kirk originated in France and began popular in the United States 1960s and 1860s and 70s. But toying with intriguing curves and angles, Diana thought. What did they say? When did you say it was built? 1871, Lily asked. Yes, what a year. A year after the town was found. Wow, to think it has been vacant um, almost a hundred years. Not quite ninety years, since 1925. I just hope the inside looks as good as the outside. I still don't know why they didn't send you some, some interior pictures. He couldn't just snap... Why? And he couldn't just snap some with his cell phone. And that is the end of the sample.